This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 33, recorded on May 10th, 2012. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from the Medical University of South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, Vincent. How are you this afternoon? Very well. How's uh, the weather down there in the South? Well, it's it's beautiful. It's an official state holiday. Today is Confederate Memorial Day, May 10th. <laughs> Just... That that is not a joke. It is indeed an official state holiday of South Carolina. That's it's funny. Confederate Memorial Day, and any time, I think we can remember remember veterans. Uh, it's a good thing. So this is to commemorate the loss of the Civil War. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. The loss of those individuals who fought uh, during uh, the Civil War, which is now well over 150 years ago. It was May 10th, the particular, the important date, or is it just picked at random? I don't know. I, I am a native of Chicago, so I didn't go through uh, primary and secondary school where I learned all that That's history. Right. And you're on the opposite side also, so you wouldn't have Yeah, I was, I'm a damn Yankee. I've come and stayed. <laughs> all right. Well, up here, it's a pretty nice day. It's blue skies, some clouds, 60s. We're moving into uh, spring. It's very nice. Terrific. We have another special guest two weeks in a row on TWIM. Uh, someone right here in my department. So if, if those of you don't know who are listening, I'm at Columbia University Medical Center in New York City, the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. And today we have a colleague of mine in the same department, a rather young assistant professor, hasn't only been here a couple of years, Ivo Ivanov. Welcome. Yes. Hi, Vincent. I'm glad to be here. So your first name is actually Ivalio? Yeah, my first name is Ivalio, which is a very Bulgarian name, actually. It's Bulgarian? Yeah. Is that where you're from? Yes, I'm oh. from Bulgaria. And Ivo is the short version, but can yeah, we'll, be from a lot of countries. You know, can be anything. We'll call you Ivo. Is yeah, okay? Ivo is fine. Even though it's Ivalio, it's shortened to Ivo, right? Yep. When did you come to the U.S.? Oh, I've came here for my PhD and then did my PhD at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Oh, okay. So even deeper south than than Michael probably. So did you train as a immunologist? Yes, okay. I trained with um, Harry Schroeder, who mm -hmm. was in the division of clinical immunology there, headed by Max Cooper at UAB at okay. that time. So. And then you came to New York to do a postdoc with yes. Dan Littman. So I've been in New York for the last. Eight years, something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you're here at Columbia two years, right? Oh. A little less, a year and a half almost. Wow. Yeah. I remember your job talk here, and it involved the story that we're going to talk about today. And I remember saying, this is just so cool. And <laughs> uh, everyone will see how neat it is. I wanted to talk about um, a paper you had published now as, as a postdoc, I suppose. Uh, it was published in Cell. It's called Intestinal TH17 Cells by Segmented Filamentous Bacteria. This is basically your job talk, this paper, right? Right, yes. More or less. It, I think the paper was not out yet when yeah. <laughs> I gave the talk. So it's a really neat story of how bacteria in the gut shape the immune response, basically, right? Mm -hmm. Now, we have a pretty broad audience in terms of um, what they know. And so perhaps since this has TH17 in the title, <laughs> and to help Michael, right? <laughs> yes. Wow. I'm sorry. Wow. I'm sorry, you guys. Hopefully you guys are nice to uh, immunologists here. <laughs> it's okay. I am in a department of uh, principally immunologists, so I, right? I, I get to hear all of these uh, talks with alphabet soup almost on a weekly basis. So, <laughs> so you've picked I it all up, huh? Well, it's it's like any foreign language. Uh, if you use it, you lose it. And the problem with the immunologists is they keep changing the vocabulary. That's right. Well, when I was a student, uh, there are there was only one kind of CD4 
T cell. Yeah. And then there were TH1 and TH2. And now yeah. we have TH2. Actually, I had somebody, I think Vijay Kutra once told me he was giving a talk about TH1 and TH2 and TH17. And at the end of the talk, a student came to him and said, Well, what happened with TH3, 4, <laughs> 5, 6, 7, 8? <laughs> I think we're building to that probably. But they don't exist right now, right? Yeah, but there's like TH9 oh, there are. and TH22. and. So that is based on the interleukins that are induced? That's right. So there's, yeah. So All let's start are... at the beginning. A C, what is a CD4 positive T cell? So, well, CD4 T cells are part of the leukocytes of the adaptive immune system. So the adaptive immune system is the system that specifically recognizes antigens on different pathogens in order to clear them. And there are two main types of uh, adaptive immune cells called B cells and T cells. And then the B cells produce antibodies and the T cells actually are divided by in two. One are the CD8 T cells, which are uh, effector cells that actually kill um, cells that are infected or kill uh, pathogens directly. And CD4 T cells produce cytokines, they're also called helper T cells, they produce cytokines that theoretically help other cells. They either recruit other immune cells or help B cells um, uh, produce antibodies or help other T cells. So the way I look at that is the CD8 cells are the foot soldiers of the immune system and the CD4 cells are the officers of the immune system. Exactly. Something like that, yes. So they, they make the rules. Um, so, so the CD4s are the cells that are infected by HIV, for example. Right? Exactly. So they're, these are the cells that are tackled by mm. uh, certain pathogens, such so, as HIV. So they were originally divided into Th1 and Th2 based on the kinds of cytokines they produce. Yeah, right? so originally the two, they were divided again into uh, depending on the cytokines they mm -hmm. produce and then the pathogens they recognize or they uh, fight. Okay. So it was considered that Th1 cell, cells fight intracellular pathogens and Th2 cells are against uh, uh, parasites, helminths, and extracellular So Th1s could be for both bacterial, intracellular bacterial infections yes, and viral so, infections. And viral infections, that's right. So that's the... Okay. And then at some point... Another type of CD4 was found that was called TH17. Yeah, so that happened maybe, I think, in 2005 or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a paper and came out from DNX at that time. Uh, I actually don't know what they are now. Uh, but oh, The uh, company DNAX, of, yeah. The company DNAX, mm -hmm. yes. And uh, they had uh, discovered a new cytokine called IL-23, one of the features of Th1 cells is that they need a cytokine called IL-12 in order to develop. Uh, however, uh, there was, was always been a paradox why even though um, when you attack, when you clear IL-12 from the system, the antibodies that um, uh, deplete IL-12, that will lead to loss of Th1 cells and loss of certain mm -hmm. uh, autoimmune conditions. However, if you just deplete the function of Th1 cells and the main effect of cytokine is interferon gamma, the effects were different. There was no effect on the disease. So people have uh, been, this has been a paradox, long-standing mm -hmm. paradox. And mm -hmm. what these guys at DNX discovered, they discovered the cytokine IL-23, which shares some common um, features with IL-12. Okay. And actually the antibodies, the reagents that were used against IL-12 actually also uh, deplete this other cytokine IL-23. And that kind of leads to this paradox in terms of the effects. And they discovered that the cytokine IL-23 drives another helper T-cell subset called TH17 cells because right. they make IL-17. That's their effector cytokine. And then there is yet another subset called T-regs that we should talk about, which is right. important. And then that's the fourth... Uh, at least for now, recognized main subset of CD4 T cells. Mm -hmm. All these Th1, Th2, and Th17s, these are pro-inflammatory cells. They produce cytokines that recruit other cells into the um, infection site in order to fight off the infection. However, once the infection is gone, uh, or under other 
circumstances, you need this response to subside. So you need to um, to uh, tune down the response. Mm-hmm. And that's done by these regulatory T cells. These okay. are CD4 T cells with suppressive functions. So some um, human inflammatory diseases have defects in Treg function. Is that correct? Yes. So yeah. So there is a human condition, uh, and I, again, I know the acronym. It's IPEX. I. PEX, mm-hmm. in which there's a deficiency in the transcription factor for uh, T-Rex. So these cells don't develop and these people suffer from um, uh, a lot of autoimmune inflammatory conditions. Here's the name, immunodysregulation, polyendocrinopathy, enteropathy, X-linked syndrome. <laughs> and I don't blame you for not remembering that one. So that's a defect in TH17s. That's sorry, that's a defect in T-Rex. T-Rex, so sorry. So these people don't have T-Rex. And actually, I think mo- these patients die relatively young. Ah, they don't have T-Rex at all. So they have an over-ambitious immune exactly. response all so the in, time. In, but the transcriptional activator, which is Fox P3, P3 yes. that's the big player. Exactly. So that's, the, that's actually the... Um, the defect in this particular condition. There's mm-hmm. a, a defect in FOXP3, which drives T-Rex. That's pretty good, Michael. I'm impressed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, all these helper T cells require certain transcription factors. That's right. what uh, that's what drives them, drives the differentiation. And and so T, TH17s have their own transcription yeah, factor. Yeah, so TH17s have their own transcription factor that we also described um in 2006, that's mm-hmm. called our gamma T. Okay. So basically the story we're going to talk about is that the development of TH17 cells in mice requires a bacterium, right? Mm-hmm. So when you came to the Lip- Littman lab, I was going to say Lipkin, but it's here, <laughs> to the Littman lab. They look alike. A <laughs> <laughs> they both have big labs too. Uh, did you come to work on this or was this, was this something you... No, actually my I came... To the Litman lab because I wanted, well, I wanted to work in the gut. I wanted to work uh-huh. with mucosal immunity. And at that point, they have actually described this, um, uh, a mouse, a report on MAR for this transcription factor, ROR gamma T. Mm-hmm. But they only knew that it's involved in lymphoid differentiation. So I wanted to see um, how it directs the, dif- the differentiation development of lymphoid structures in the intestine. So it wasn't known at the time that ROR gamma T was a TH17? No, the TH17 cells were not known, and it actually ROR gamma T was not known to be expressed in a mature T cells. Okay. It was expressed in uh, double positive thymocytes, but uh, it wasn't known that it's expressed in T cells. And TH17s were not known when you started your post? They were not defined as a separate I subset, see. no. So, okay. So, it was so how did you get into this uh, mouse bacteria TH17 story? What led to it? So that's what led to it. So basically I started analyzing these reporter mice right. uh, because I was interested in how B cells, I came from a B cell lab, how B cells are recruited to the gut. Mm-hmm. And this transcription factor is expressed in a subset of uh, cells, lymphoid precursor cells mm-hmm. that actually recruit other cells in the gut. So I started uh, characterizing the mice, and basically within the few, first few months in the lab, I saw that this transcription factor is expressed also on T-cells, and very specifically in the intestine. Mm-hmm. So uh, with that observation, we fi- I tried to figure out what these cells are, mm-hmm. what these T-cells are, and it turned out that they make L17. They didn't make any of the other cytokines, like interferon gamma or L4, okay. and they made L17. So... At that point, we actually formed a collaboration with the DNAx group, mm-hmm. which were had discovered and were basically working on TH17 cells mm-hmm. as such. So, uh, all right. So you had a mouse. You were you found TH17 cells in the gut, mm-hmm. and then how did you get into the segmented bacteria story? So, so yeah. So then we showed that our gamma T is the transcription factor right. for TH17 cells. And what I was interested in, most people were interested in what makes TH17 cells bad because they were shown and have been shown in a number of autoimmune inflammatory conditions in mice mm-hmm. and in humans mm-hmm. to be the main 
driver of this inflammation, autoimmune inflammation. Would this be like Crohn's and colitis? Crohn's, uh, psoriasis, mm -hmm. rheumatoid arthritis, um, multiple sclerosis. Uh, in all of these conditions where you have an over uh, activated immune system, it's an autoimmune inflammatory condition. Okay. These cells are main drivers of inflammation, and actually there are a lot of drugs now in development that specifically target these cells. Because as I mentioned, the drugs that have been used so far are against IL-12, uh, also target IL-23, but they also deplete TH1 cells, both TH1 and TH17. So. Mm -hmm. Which would be bad. Which, uh, so it, it has been thought that that is okay, because TH1 cells can also contribute to the disease, but there are more and more reports popping up that actually TH1 cells have beneficial effects in certain conditions. So actually targeting those cells could be bad, and that's why uh, people are trying to develop more mm -hmm. specific therapies. So you said you were interested in the gut immune system. So when you started this, did you have some sense that it would involve gut microbiota? Well, when I started, we know I knew that they are in the gut under yeah. normal conditions. So what I'm interested in was and still interested in what do these cells do for mm -hmm. immunity? What okay. good? What is their beneficial effect? Because we know that they are bad in inflammation, but right. but they must be there for a reason. So, and the only place where we could find them was the gut. Mm -hmm. If if there is no inflammation, if there is inflammation, you can find them wherever the inflammation is. But okay. So in a normal in a normal mouse, mouse, and where in the gut? Large, small intestine. And, and it seemed that they ha that they were more present in the small intestine. So okay. they were very very abundant in the small intestine and a little bit less in the large intestine. So you're, what you're saying is, if there is an inflammation in the heart, these cells will go there. Exactly. So if, if it's a certain type of inflammation, yeah, they will be right. there. So for example, during MS or uh, multiple sclerosis or the mouse models, we see them in the brain okay. um, and they cause inflammation there. If there is uh, in psoriasis, you see them in the skin. Uh, in rheumatoid arthritis, okay. you see them in the joints. So the gut is their resting place. But the gut, yes, I guess it's their resting place or educational place, yeah, training educate. place, whatever you want. <laughs> Although, I, I think educational is a good <laughs> metaphor. I think education is a good metaphor. And that's probably uh, a good place to digress here for a second to, to really point out that these are adaptive cells that are reacting. And that, that will get to our story about what the bacteria are doing and and how they're beginning to interact in the gut. And I think that if if the listeners keep in the back of their mind that it's the gut is sort of the education location for these cells, you'll have an easier time with the alphabet soup. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think we're we're getting a title out of this, Michael. Well, yeah. <laughs> All right, go ahead, yeah. Eva, go ahead. So, um, so yeah, so we, I was interested in what are the signals in the gut and what mm -hmm. is so unique about the gut. And we tried, of course, a few uh, cytokines and things like that, uh, but nothing seemed to be really obvious. And then I kind of came up with this idea that, well, what is unique about the intestine when we think about that? When one of the most u unique features of the gut is the presence of all these commensal bacteria. It's a large community. There is... Um, and people use these comparisons that um, there are 10 times more, 10 to 100 times more bacterial cells in our bodies than there are human cells. So actually on cellular level, we yeah. are less than 10% human, right? Because there's all these gut bacteria. And so, and these, these guys basically affect uh, a lot of the physiology of the host of, the, of, the, of our body, which has been known for a while. And what we are promoting now, found out that they also affect the immune system and the immune homeostasis in the gut. So we basically looked whether these bacteria are important. First of all, are they required for TH17 cell generation and really treated mice with antibiotics? Or we looked at germ-free animals, which mm -hmm. are animals that don't have any bacteria or microorganisms. And we basically saw that if you don't have bacteria, if there is no bacteria in the gut, there are no TH17 cells. Mm -hmm. And the other, the other important thing we found out is that there is not, not just the presence of bacteria that is required. So it's not a matter of just putting some bacteria mm -hmm. 
that will um, induce TH17 cells, but you actually need certain bacteria. Mm -hmm. Not all bacteria uh, do it. And uh, that's how we started um, on the road of identifying what these bacteria are, and we came up with this segmented filamentous bacteria. So having mice from two different companies was an important part of it, right? right? So that was an important part. So that was indication because one of the first experiments we did was we looked at germ-free animals. And germ-free right. animals don't have any bacteria, any, any TH17 cells. Right. Uh, if you give the germ-free animals and we give them actually fecal material, right. we call it fecal transplant from a conventional animal in our colony, mm -hmm. then we can develop TH17 cells. But then when we started giving these animals individual bacteria, no matter what we tried, mm -hmm. we couldn't re uh, replicate that. We couldn't induce TH17 cells. So this argued that there is either a specific bacteria that we mm -hmm. haven't tried, or maybe you need a lot of bacteria, a diversity of bacteria. But we were helped uh, in kind of serendipitous discovery that I did was that I tested mice from different locations. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that uh, mice... The two main vendors in the U.S. for mice are Jackson Laboratory and Taconic Farms. And it turned out that these two um, colonies uh, have very different numbers of TH17 cells. So if mm. we take mice, the same strain of mice, just wild-type B6 mice from Taconic, they have TH17 cells, but the mice from Jackson do not. And we showed that this is due to the bacteria in, the, in these mice because mm. if we just put the two mice together in a cage, in the same cage, they kind of uh, equilibrate their microbiota, and we can induce TH17 cells in the Jackson mice. So it was obvious that these, that the taconic mice have bacteria mm -hmm. that uh, induce TH17 cells in the Jackson mice don't. So you can take, you could do a fecal transplant from taconic to Jackson, yes. and the Jackson will develop. Yeah, we develop or put them but in you don't have to do a fecal transplant because no. the mice eat their own stool. Exactly. Put them in and the same so, cage, yeah. You can put yeah, them together, you, yeah. Yeah, you could even do a, a mixing experiment where you just literally collect the stool and drop it into the cage. Yeah. And there's enough biomass there to protect the anaerobes so they, they won't uh, die off. Yes. And it's a, as it turns out, these guys are actually very special anaerobes, so they make spores, so they're even more hmm. resistant to... So just as an aside, how do you measure... TH17 cells in the in the mouse gut. What do you actually do? Do you do flow, well, flow cytometry? The way we do it, we isolate the cells and we look for, yeah, we do flow cytometry and stain for the cytokine. So uh, we can 17, do IL-17? IL-17, yes. Okay. And that's, and that's an important uh, point is that the way TH17 cells are um, identified right now is mm. by looking for IL-17. Right. CD4 T cells that make IL-17 what we don't know is if all TH17 cells are made equal. I mean, sure, they sure. all produce IL-17, but maybe some of them, they have something else, and that's mm -hmm. what makes them pathogenic, actually, or, or, or protective. Okay, so you look for CD4 and IL-17 at the same time. Yes, right? and, and TCR beta and CD4 and IL-17, okay. yeah. All right. That's so you had two strains from two different vendors, and then... What's the next thing to find out which bacterium so, it is? So then, yeah, so then we came up with this hypothesis that, okay, maybe it's a bacteria that's in one strain but right. not in the other. And we, what we did was we analyzed the microbiota of the mm -hmm. two strains. And they actually, they're the same strain, they're just two colonies. They come from two different strain, places. Strain of mice, two different yeah, vendors. Yeah, two different vendors. And, um, and this has been done in humans and it's been, that's uh, analyzing, so... We cannot grow all, most of the bacteria in the gut, but right. we can at least tell what's there mm -hmm. by doing um, by doing sequencing, high throughput sequencing, uh, sequencing of genomic DNA isolated. And people do this from different samples. They can sure. do it from soil or stool. We did it from the stool of the mice, and um, we basically compared the microbial composition of the two colonies, mm -hmm. and it was very different. Uh, and indeed, you can actually take a mouse without knowing where it's coming from, analyze the microbiota, and can tell it's coming from which vendor? German, German town on the yeah, <laughs> which vendor wow. it's coming from, or <laughs> which colony probably it's coming from. Yeah. Um, so, and when we did that, they were very different the two communities. But when we looked for things that are present in one but completely absent in the other, there were a few, okay. and uh, the top two candidates 
uh, were a lactobacillus mm -hmm. that we have tried before, actually, because for different reasons. And uh, this species of segmented filamentous bacteria, which uh, were, are very unique bacteria. Um, they have been characterized a long time ago, and they have been known to stimulate the immune system in certain ways, but nobody knows, knew what their function is. Mm -hmm. Segmented, segmented filamentous bacteria, which you call SFB, and they have a, prov a provisional name in this first paper, Candidatus Arthromitus. Arthromitus. Yes. It was actually, this was coined by Joseph Leidy in 1870-something, or really? in the 18th century, yes. Uh, just simply by morphology, he identified certain bacteria. Arthromitus means arthros is joint and mitus is like a thread, so it's... Uh, They'll because have this, it's segmented. It's segmented and it looks yeah. f like a big filament, yes. So they're very interesting pictures we'll link to. Um, they're, as we say, s long filamentous with segments, but they're very tightly associated with the wall of the intestine. Yeah, right? so that's they, they, these bacteria have a lot of unique features, and that's one of them. Mm -hmm. The fact that they actually bind very tightly to the epithelial cells and this is unique because most other commensals do not actually interact with the epithelial cell directly. There is the epithelial cells in the gut uh, produce uh, something called mucus, mm -hmm. which covers the lining of the epithelium. And in this mucus, uh, the epithelial cells produce a lot of antimicrobial substances. Uh, that's where I secretory IgA, mm -hmm. uh, immunoglobulins are produced. And these are all mechanisms to keep most of the bacteria away uh, a little bit away. So bacteria is there, but it's not directly interacting with the epithelial cells. And these guys are one of the few ones that can do that. Uh, do the segmented filaments bacteria have an IgA protease? Have you done the quick and dirty PCR to ask if they have at least the gene for that protease? Right. So we, we've sequenced the genome, and that's uh, last year, and they don't have a prote IgA protease, at least by annotation, but they do have some proteases extracellular proteases that might be used for that. Why, why do you ask, Michael? Well, you know, a lot of the um, microbes in, below the diaphragm have a, mm -hmm. uh, IgA protease. It's one of their virulence factors. And in fact, many of the bacteria in the oral cavity similarly have an IgA uh, protease because it's uh, a mucosal surface and it's effectively how the body protects or keeps the microbes in check. So, the reason I asked whether or not it had this protease is because by virtue of the fact that it doesn't have it, it may be refractory to the IgA protease where, I mean, for refractory to IgA such that it won't bother it. And because of its close association with the boundary layer that is producing IgA, it may have evolved a special relationship with that location such that it's indifferent to IgA, the immune system isn't aggravated by it, or the Th17 or the other aspects of the immune system that's involved in this opera of, of cells with FOX3B and some of the other associated cytokine expression that you have with Th17 may be uh, allowing this bacterium to effectively coexist, which is involved in then toning the epithelial layer uh, or our colonic layer so that it, it's um, strong. And if mm -hmm. you think about it, if prolonged steroid therapy actually weakens the intestine such that the microbes uh, you can actually perforate much more easily. The, the strength of that uh, boundary is, is not as good. Um, so, you know, when you suppress the immune system, the colon isn't as hardy as mm -hmm. it is when you have a, a normal functioning and intact immune system. So I, I just find this microbe... Um, fascinating. I'm trying to get my arms around how. How does it uh, coexist there? And so that's why I was curious about um, 
the presence or absence of the IgA protease. So it's not surprising that it's absent, and it would be curious to figure out how this microbe is coexisting in a location in which you're dumping out uh, an immune molecule that, you know, is designed to kill bacteria or at least, you know, mm, target right. it for death. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, I think that there is, this is a truly symbiotic relationship uh, because indeed there are, um, there is something in the literature about IgA, relation with, relationship with IgA, because mice um, uh, in a Japanese group did that, the Tasuku Honjo's group, uh, a while back, when they looked in these AID knockout mice, which are mice that don't, uh, they only make IgM, but they don't make any other isotype, uh, including IgA in the gut. And in these mice, actually, what they saw in the intestine, they saw an, uh, basically an outgrowth chaotic outgrowth of SFB everywhere. Hmm. Usually SFB are only present in the terminal ileum. That's where they interact with the epithelial cells. That's where they do what they do. In the rest of the intestine, they're in the in the feces, but they're not interacting with the epithelial cells. Hmm. So now when you don't have IgA, now they go, can go a- everywhere. And then... Yeah, so that it makes sense with not having a protease. Yeah, yeah. so there's a really uh, interaction between the host and the bacteria that yeah. makes it establishes this symbi- symbiotic relationship where the bacteria only lives in one place and does certain things to the host. So these these cannot be cultured these these F- no, FBs. We, right? they ha- we haven't been able to culture them, and we kind of know from the genome why because they're just so well adapted to live in this environment that they they have actually lost almost all. Uh, genes that uh, mm-hmm. other bacteria have. They are actually in the Clostridium family, which is a very big family, but they have almost three times smaller genome. Mm-hmm. So And so, actually, metabolically, they are more similar to mycoplasmas than they are to another bacteria. So they are, have very reduced genomes. And that may be, we think that maybe an evolutionary kind of adaptation to ascertain their uh, right, living in right. the host in this environment. So the lack of all these essential genes, does that, from that, can you tell whether uh, they would get functions from the human cells or bacteria in the gut or both? Yeah, so we think that they're getting most of it from the host, and they probably can get it from other bacteria, but we know for sure that they can live just by themselves because we have access, we are collaborating with a Japanese group that generated uh, back in the 90s, early 90s, SFB monocolonized mice. So they mm. have mice that only have ah. SFB, no other bacteria. Uh, and and that's how you get your bacterial culture. That's how we're getting our bacterial <laughs> cultures now. Wow. So you can only grow it in the mice. <laughs> right. So I guess if you took a, a germ-free mouse and put SFB in it, it would grow in that, right? Exactly. It grows in that very well. And So that tells you that it's using the host to yeah, implement all this Yeah, at least defects. the host yeah. is enough. Uh, oh, okay. It's sufficient. So how did you prove, what was the experiment that proved that these cells, these bacterial cells, induce uh, Th17 cells? So that was actually the experiment. We were able, by doing the analysis, and we had SFB as a candidate, and we were able to show that it correlates with the presence of Th17 mm-hmm. cells. But of course, one of the Koch postulates is that you have to actually have a pure culture right, of the bacteria, right. give it and show that it uh, you know, causes the phenotype. And we didn't have that, but luckily for us, these Japanese guys in the company in Japan, which is very famous, called Yakult, it's, I think, the second largest food uh, Mm -hmm. company in Japan. They, back in the 90s, made these SFB monocolonized mice. They Mm -hmm. created germ-free mice that only have SFB in a very tedious procedure at the time. Uh, And they made it for no particular reason, I think, <laughs> rather than they have a collection of different bacteria. They have a, an institute, which I visited a couple of years ago, a very nice institute, a microbiology institute, where they have all these different, they basically cloned a lot of um, bacteria from the intestine, from mm-hmm. human and from mice. And and uh, because they make this, their most important product is this uh, drink. It's a probiotic drink called uh, Yakult. Mm-hmm. Um that's discovered in the 60s, and that's how the company was funded. But So they're interested in this kind of research, so they made these mice. And and they were very kind enough to send us, actually, these pure right. 
pure cultures, fecal cultures, yeah. uh, that we could then introduce into germ-free mice and directly show that, well, now we have one bacteria that induces TB. So these fecal cultures have only SFB in them? And they have only SFB because mm -hmm. that's what we use to sequence the genome and we know that there is there that. quite... So you feed that to a germ-free... Yes, animal, you can, yeah. and then they make Th17 cells. And then they make Th17 cells, very similar to what just the, a normal mouse Right, makes. and the control is feces from a germ-free mouse? Yeah, control is feces. Or we tried, we've tried a lot of, a range of other bacteria, bacteria. that we isolated they don't do from, it, yeah. and nothing so far except SFB has been able to do it. So how does the bacteria induce Th17 cells? In well, that... That's that is, a sixty-four that's, million dollar question. That's why I have a job, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the things. Uh, oh, you don't have an answer yet. <laughs> no, we don't have an answer, and actually, very little is known about that. Uh -huh. But um, that's the fun part now. But one of the things you showed in this paper was that uh, something called serum amyloid A is induced, right? right? And so that's involved. You say. In so the um, yeah. So when the bacteria colonizes the mice, there we did a lot of expression arrays and right. things like that. So th there's a whole bunch of, a whole slew of molecules that are induced. And one of them was this uh, serum amyloid A that kind mm -hmm. of drew our attention because uh, normally that's an acute phase protein uh, during inflammatory responses. But uh, there were some reports and there are some reports that this particular protein induces IL-23 production from dendritic cells, and we know that IL-23 is important uh, for Th17 cells. So that's why in the paper we kind of zoomed in on this molecule uh, and we showed that it actually is induced in lamina propria disease. Mm -hmm. And we showed that in vitro at least it can help with a Th17 cell differentiation. But whether this is the main mechanism by which SFB acts is we don't know. Don't know. So if you add one experiment you did, you added recombinant S SAA mm -hmm. serum amyloid A to cultures of C D four and also dendritic cells. You have and to dendritic, have both. yeah. And that produces that makes the C D fours become TH seventeen cells. Right. Is that yes. Correct? Yes. If, if you don't have the dendritic cells, it doesn't happen, right? No, because you need the dendritic cells to... When We don't know what is the role of the dendritic cells mm -hmm. in these cultures because in order for for T cells to be to become a Th1 or Th2, Th17 cells, you need at least two things. You need an antigen-presenting cells, which can be a dendritic okay. cell, okay. and you also need an appropriate cytokine environment. And dendritic cells can provide both, but in vitro, whether this happens in vivo, we yeah. don't... No. So you think the SAA is binding the dendritic cell? So we think that the SAA is acting on the dendritic cell and inducing a cytokine such as IL-23, mm -hmm. um, for example, that is helping TH17 cell, but we don't right. know whether that's the mechanism. That's the bottom part. If you just add IL-23 and I think you say IL-6 mm -hmm. to these cultures without SAA, is that enough to... Make yes, TH17s. so so in vitro, if you take naive T cells and stimulate them, provide them, stimulate them, activate them, whether with dendritic cells or with antibodies, and if you put IL six and TGF beta, these are the two, and IL twenty three, these are the mm -hmm. cytokines that will make any cell become TH seventeen cell. Okay, okay. So this is one of the things you're interested in your lab, how SAA works or how... Uh, no, we are not focusing on SAA. We actually are interested more like how are the signals from the bacteria transmitted and mm -hmm. what are the cells in vivo that recognize uh, the bacteria okay. or signals from the bacteria in order to induce TH17 cells. So we're interested in what whether this is a dendritic cell, whether, are the whether these are the epithelial cells, and then what is what are the molecules that uh, mediate right. this this right. interaction? That will be the next cell paper, right? Uh, hope cell so. papers are <laughs> long and hard. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we want something faster. <laughs> yeah. Uh, along those same lines of of the importance of 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 this naturally transmitted segmented filamentous bacteria. When I was reading, I I was I stumbled across a paper by Martin Kriegel. Um, Essen Sefek, Jonathan Hill, Hissen Zunwo, Christopher Bensowit, and Diane Mathis. Forgive mm -hmm. me if I mispronounced mm -hmm. their names, but 
Here they they looked at the same segmented filamentous bacterium, and they were looking at autoimmune-based diabetes, and they uh, showed that um, in non-obese diabetic mice that were housed under germ-free conditions, and this is an old observation that's been known for over 25 years, that um, when they didn't have this segmented filamentous bacterium, you know, you exasperated the diabetes, the autoimmune-based diabetes, and when you had this bacterium, they were better. So I think what we've stumbled into is the beginnings of, of really being able to address the whole issue of commensal organisms having this ability to influence the host. And I think in one of your papers, and I don't know if you coined this term or, or someone else coined it, but it's referred to as the microbial organ. And so how, how this uh, microbial organ, whether it be the commensal bacteria or whether it be just simply one bacterium like this segmented filamentous bacterium that's in the order of the clostridia, uh, how it begins to tune our immune system for proper activity. And when things get out of whack, either we disrupt the normal flora of, of this uh, tuning mechanism, either with antibiotics or some um, other process, uh, autoimmunity uh, then gets the upper hand and can wreak havoc. And you can develop things like autoimmune-based diabetes. You can develop things like Crohn's disease. You can uh, develop inflammatory bowel disease. And it really drives home the importance of how we're going to have to begin to tease apart this extremely complex opera that's going on between the commensal microbes in the gut. And I think you were truly lucky in that it's one microbe that's having this influence on this one subset of uh, CD4 cells, uh, TH17, and who knows what um, else is in store for us as we begin to tease apart these these other microbes that seem to come and go. Think about some of our past TWIM episodes where we were talking about autism, uh, and which was another one of your colleagues, Vincent, at Columbia, where they found Sutterella mm -hmm. was associated mm -hmm. with, again, the gut that was responsible for an association in an autistic population. It wasn't, you know, cause and effect like we're seeing with this TH17. And then we have the other incidents where we had a discussion of about Helicobacter being absent in the stomach. And these are you know, God-fearing virulent helicobacter that result in ulcers and the development of gastric cancers when we're older. But if absent when we're younger, we develop asthma. And so the, the stomach is a very different immune location than uh, the small intestine and the large intestine. And you begin to, to ask yourself the question, how, how is this all talking to us that we're then seeing a real phenotype because asthma is a measurable phenotype. Autism is a measurable phenotype. So you begin to try to figure this out and it's, it's really pretty complicated uh, when you begin to try to take it apart a piece at a time. He got lucky. Yeah. yeah. Luck is you, sometimes you really, needed. As you, you said, it's luck. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, this is very important and it's very, very complicated. But but I think, and really that was one of the, maybe it was luck, but that was one of the, for me, that's hope because that's the way we can tease this apart is by identifying very specific examples of these kind of interactions and studying the mechanism. Because if you just try to study the mechanism by way, um, in the context of the, Heterogeneous population of bacteria, 
it will be very difficult to tease, sure, tease sure. it apart. Or the, even the immune system. If you just look or even the, the immune system, yes. If you just look in the immune system in a vacuum, you'll never figure this out. You need, you need the bacteria. And I think it's a function of your training because there's a famous quote by Pasteur, chance favors the prepared mind. I was just thinking of that, yep. <laughs> and, and, you know, that could be a title too, Vincent. Chance yeah. favors the prepared mind. Yeah. Uh, looking at this, because of your background at UAB, which has a strong history in mucosal immunity and really understanding and, and ra- being able to wrap your head around mucosal immunity, the importance of IgA, and then your postdoctoral experience of, of moving into the gut, you just may have been at the right place at the right time in the everything just came together and you got lucky with being able to buy your animals from two different vendors. <laughs> yes. But I think I, yeah, there, there are several like lessons I've learned with this experience. And one of them was in this particular case was uh, always questioning yourself and always doing the right controls and, mm, yeah. and not discarding experiments because with this, with the two lines, there's an interesting story there how I noticed that. But a lot of people would have discarded uh, some results if they if if they see something different. Um, and the other thing is that uh, I, I when I was a graduate student, actually a little bit before I graduated, somebody had put it in, had, had put up in the hallway a cartoon, and the cartoon said something like, two months at the bench can save you two hours in the library." <laughs> <laughs> and uh and i, I i've been uh, <laughs> that was ring a bell for me because ring re- really true for me at that time mm-hmm. and then That's as good. a postdoc actually the the story with sfb the way we describe it in the paper is you know we did this comparison macrobiota but actually i had zoomed in on sfb much before we did all the studies like a year before because what I did was I noticed that the TH17 cells, this kind of phenotype correlate with IgA. And then I looked for bacteria that induce IgA in the literature and found these old papers from the 80s and 90s that were talking yeah. about SFB. So we are actually really focused on SFB even when we did the analysis yeah. of the microbiota. So I think you can find a lot of good stuff in the old papers. Sure. <laughs> Let me put it that yeah. way. That's for sure. So one of the things you did in the next paper, uh, which you just published last year, which is cell host and microbe, that's the sequence of the genome of this bacteria. And this was, I presume, done from animals that are monocolonized. With right. So this was done from the feces of the monocolonized okay. mice. And yeah. as we said before, these are, this is a minimal genome. It's very small and lacks a lot of genes. It explains why you can't um, culture them in, in, uh, in broth. Um, so one of the things you do in this paper is look in human feces, and you don't find uh, these sequences at mm-hmm. all. So, and you say at the, at least at the detection level we don't see it. So probably they're not there, right? Right. Although we are trying. Well, the way we did this was by looking at the published databases, like the mm-hmm. Human um, Microbiome Project database, and. Uh, of course, the disadvantage is that, first of all, all of these samples that are in these databases are from are fecal samples. Right. And as I said, our bacteria is very um, endemic for the ileum, although in mice we can detect it in the feces. So, um, And the other thing is the sample population mm-hmm. in these databases. It's mostly, you know, they're actually having problems because I think the HMP database was done at WashU and Baylor, so it turns out that most of their samples are from medical students from <laughs> WashU and Baylor. So, so they're, they're, in a way, there are a lot of samples, but they're not that, um, uh, that heterogeneous. So uh, maybe it's a sample thing. But yeah. then, of course, the other um, possibility is that in human there is some, something else that's doing sure. the same thing. Another and, one or and, maybe and multiple bacteria. Or multiple. Yeah. And that's really why we think that studying the mechanism will be more important because maybe the bug is different, but what the mechanism, the action, the the mechanism yeah. or the... So you, you figure out the signaling in mice and then you look in people and you see if you, the same pathways are there. Exactly. Work that backwards, w- yeah. Yeah, that will be there. So um, the, I don't know if you know, but recently the um, the 
gut microbiome has been greatly expanded um, by by more work. There was actually a Nature paper, a Nature article, uh, I think last month. Um, yeah. We talked about it on Twitter where they question the original dif- uh, dividing of the microbiome into three enterotypes. Mm-hmm, it seems to mm-hmm. be very blurry. And so there are over a thousand new uh, microbiome sequences there. So maybe yeah. it, at some point when that becomes available, you look there as well. Yeah, I mean, it. as I said, this we did this one year ago, but now it's sure. like so much more stuff out there that we we should. You know what this reminds me of is the the, the world of uh, physics and the unified field folks where they're, they're developing or finding all these subatomic particles like quarks and charms <laughs> and all these other things where they're trying to put things together. And I guess you can look at the commensal bacteria of, of the human or the microbial organ as you describe in your paper as I guess the equivalent of, of gravity, if you were equating it back to the unified field theory to, to physics, because I guess gravity is the the great equalizer or they're trying to, you know, put gravity into it to, you know, unify mm-hmm. the, the physics world. So mm-hmm. I guess what we're seeing is the beginning of, of the unification of, of the microbiome in the immune system where when microbiology was in its infancy, uh, immunology too was in its infancy and the two went hand in glove. And then we diverged, uh, from one another. And now I think we're seeing the convergence of, of the two disciplines yet again, where microbiology and immunology have to merge if we're going to make sense of the complex community interactions that are going on in order to understand such things as autoimmune diseases and some of the chronic human conditions that are impacting our healthcare system so so substantially for sure absolutely it's uh it's not a simple thing although absolutely. you have to, although you have to break it down to study it yeah so evo this in in your other paper you had shown that these bacteria also help protect against infection by a pathogenic bacterium, mm-hmm. a citrobacter, I think, mm-hmm. right? So these segmented bacteria have really two functions. They, um, they control the microbiome content in your gut as well as maturing Th17 cells, right? So the Th17s right. will go on and, and be used for other infections. But in the gut, doesn't part of their role to shape the, the content of the gut by doing this? They probably do. Uh, however, how they do that is not clear. It's unclear. Yeah. They can do that through Th17 cells because sure. and one thing we didn't mention about them is that the cytokines they produce, L17 and L22, they actually kind of an innate, they're kind of a bridge between native in adaptive immunity because these cytokines act on other cells, and in this case, they can act on epithelial cells like L22 mm-hmm. and induce antimicrobial peptides from the epithelial cells. So um, we see a protection against mucosal infection, which may be mediated by these antimicrobial peptides. However, how they're induced, whether this is through the Th17 cells or through other mechanisms okay, that SAB right, right, have right. Is, not, is not clear. But, but yeah, they can provide important immune functions. That was the whole point yeah. of the... So one thing we didn't touch on are uh, the Tregs. So if, if in mice that don't have Th17 cells, are, are mm-hmm. there, do they in turn have a lot of Tregs? So usually there is, there is this yin-yang, uh, yeah. yin-yang thing between the Th17 and Tregs uh, for a number of reasons. Yes, so... And we know that in germ-free mice where we don't see Th17 cells in the small intestine, and we have to make this kind of um, clarifications, mm-hmm. there are more proportionately more T-Rex. And when they colonize them with total bacteria, it goes the okay. other way around. Okay. Interestingly, though, SFB only affects the TH17 cells. Okay, yeah, that's what I was going to say. It doesn't really yeah. touch the T-Rex. And now we know that there are other bacteria, and this is a couple of papers came out in Science, one from Kenya Honda's group, where they showed that there's other bacteria, such as Clostridium, other Clostridial species, mm-hmm. They identified 46 of them that actually induce T-Rex, T-rex wow. in, in the colon. <laughs> and so so this is, was kind of great for us because it showed that it's, it's a 
what we thought that is a general kind of idea yeah, that there yeah. will be different bacteria which will affecting different immune cell subsets and depending on what kind of combination of bacteria there is, that will affect the immune sure. homeostasis. Amazing. So, it's amazing that it works. I can. Uh, what I'm amazed at is that, just think of the evolution that led to this symbiosis, right? Right. Uh, the different stages that it went through so that you have bacteria colonizing, you know, the intestine and you selecting ones that are inducing the right immune function. It has to be a balance because the immune system is trying to eliminate pathogens and has to be able to distinguish. It's incredible. Yes, it is amazing. <laughs> well, just... the the human animal was probably more selfish than that. The bacteria were probably supplying us with vitamins that we couldn't necessarily extract from our diet. And so we quickly learned, because we were dead, uh, <laughs> that if you didn't have the right microbe in your system giving you the necessary antibiotics or protecting you from diarrheal diseases so you would lose all your electrolytes, you would die. And so the selection pressures on, it's good on selection, the, yeah. On the human animal, were were profound, or any animal. It's a mammal. It's a mammalian thing, right? Yeah, because they all have guts with microbiota. I mean, these bacteria are in lots of different species, right? Yeah. Like, so uh, that's. I mean, yeah. I mean, SFB, for example, is found in a lot of species, but right? Not people, but not people. How about people. Uh, non-human primates? Have anyone looked? Yes, there? actually, there are some sequences from uh, gorillas that are there, and there is there are some from um, from rhesus, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and they have they also in insects and in fish and I was gonna speculate it's because humans have had exposure to antibiotics, but that's not true if you look at, you know, our um animal livestock that we use. And if you find the the uh, segmented filamentous bacterium in uh mm -hmm. those those animals, they certainly have had antibiotics in their food as much as we have. Had, and they certainly have been exposed to antibiotics in in the course of their lives, so it's it's probably we just haven't developed the right primer set to find the relative of the segmented filamentous mm. bacterium. Well, yeah, and interestingly, these bacteria are very host specific. For example, people have tried to introduce mouse SFB into a rat, and the other way around, and it doesn't work. So they're actually very adapted to the host species. Uh, that makes sense. That that. That truly makes sense because you would want the right one because you wouldn't want the wrong one because it would probably kill you. Right. And and also, they yeah, so they have evolved with the host also. So identifying um, such bacteria in people is also important because it would help us understand what antibiotics do mm -hmm. and how they might specifically affect us. Right, so you can imagine that overuse of antibiotics would would induce uh, inflammatory diseases, right? Because they remove the right populations of of bacteria. Right, in the that's gut. correct. Yes, and that's a challenge a little bit mm. how how to to do that. Um, and I know that actually people, my colleagues at, in Japan, they're uh, one approach that people are taking is to actually take human feces. Mm -hmm and colonize mice or yeah. germ-free mice or, or make the mice uh, appropriate hosts and then look at how these different bacteria from the human affect the immune system of the mouse or of an anim animal model. I, I think people actually do this a lot with pigs as well mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. for a number of reasons. They're germ-free pigs. Expensive experiments. These are, yeah, these oh, are yeah. kind of experiments, yeah. <laughs> wow. It's a big animal. But in your lab, you just focus on the mouse system. We're focusing right? on the mouse system, yeah, because we are actually collaborating with um, a group here uh, to try to look a little bit more carefully whether SFB is present in the human right. uh, by uh, having appropriate samples and donors. But being able to you know, really prove that... Uh, Commensals in human do the same thing as in as in it's mice. Hard. Yeah. It's, it's hard, but maybe so. it's present only in people with certain disease states, right? That's true too. So as I mentioned, this um, uh, IgA experiment yeah. in in mice, you know, maybe and 
And actually, we have thought about looking IgA deficient patients, which which is one of the yeah. main immunodeficiencies. But also in people with, um, well, let's see. So if people with inflammatory diseases don't have enough Treg, so they would have a lot of Th17s, yes. right? So maybe they are the ones to look for the presence of, of, of a yeah, certain bacteria. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. Well, you can ask the experiment in a simpler mm -hmm. way. If if you follow the logic of the experiment. Uh, when I was thinking of this, I was thinking of an appendicitis or diverticulitis, which is a localized inflammatory response where the immune system comes in to try to crush that appendix or the other appendix called the, um, uh, diavertic the diverticuli. And so you would then posit based on the segmented filamentous bacterial hypothesis that in an appendicitis, so you, you extract that organ out of the patient because it's inflamed, and you ask the question about your immune population, and then you characterize the microbes are there. I would argue that if there were any segmented filamentous relatives present, they would be absent in the acute appendicitis or the acute diverticulitis, and then if you would similarly look in the appendix that you would take out of a uh, healthy individual or you would go to that ileo junction and pull out um, that if you were doing the biopsy or in that population that we discussed with the autism, yeah. the sutarella, and ask if it's there and just do a crude subtraction, you know, Mm -hmm. brute force PCR and ask the question, you know, who's present, who's absent, you may be able to get a hint at what's going on. The other problem with looking for segmented filamentous bacteria in people is I assume everyone's hunting with 16S uh, probes. You may want to think about going after some of the um, unique genes, since the genome has been published on the segmented filamentous bacteria, doping the oligos to um, the uh, human codon bias for some of the unique proteins, and then using that PCR primer suite to go after and see if you can pull out a unique uh, clostridial gene, either to one of the spore genes or something along those lines from that bacterium rather than the 16S because it just may be a function of um, not getting enough DNA out of the sample and then PCR competition because PCR is, uh, is simple in concept but really hard because you need so many um, replicates in order and so many copies in order to know whether or not you really have um, gotten it done in terms of, you know, a no is a no. Right, yeah. Well, actually, that's what we did with the genome. We actually, we thought that the 16S is not enough, so we actually uh, screened this metagenomic database with the whole genome. We basically run the whole SFB genome through these metagenomic databases, mm -hmm. which have not just 16S, they have, I mean, tons of sequences from all bacteria that's in the in the human samples. And we came up with nothing basically yeah, but again that's but you know may not be the right sample it may not be the yeah. right samples yeah um the the other the other thing that is is complicates the issue is that a lot of people are doing this type of analysis where they are following the microbiota in different patient populations compared in different diseases autism or inflammatory diseases or anything all like this and there has been a big drive to identify you know pro-inflammatory microbiota or bacteria mm. that cause IBD, for example, inflammatory bowel disease. But what I think what, what we are talking here is a little bit different. You know, we are talking about how the commensal bacteria under normal conditions modifies this immune response. So it doesn't cause any kind of profound inflammation. We don't even know if the Th17 cells that are induced by SFB are the same that are induced by Helicobacter because Helicobacter also induces Th17 cells, but it's because it causes inflammation um, in mice. So any any pathogen that will cause inflammation, we also induce Th17 cells, I see, I see, which are yeah. pro-inflammatory. But the ones that are present normally, they're not. They don't cause inflammation, so they do something else. Yeah. 
And that's so I didn't coin the term microbial organ. Let's say that, but I did coin a term called immunological fitness. So what I think is that this bacteria is affecting the immunological fitness, meaning it's not causing any kind of profound response or inflammation or anything like that normally. But if you have a challenge like infection or um, autoimmune disease or something else, now your system will respond differently depending mm -hmm. on what bacteria is there. Okay. Um, and that's the... That's the whole idea. And and I think that the effects of these commensals are much more subtle than of the pathogens and because they don't cause any profound microscopical inflammation or right, anything like right, that. Right. So those mechanisms may be more actually relevant for for developing therapies than targeting a mechanism mm -hmm. of a pathogen. Okay, so you're interested in what happens normally during the development of these cells in a non-pathogenic non situation. Non-pathogenic situation, And then exactly. by understanding that, it may give you ways to uh, to intervene when there is a, a, a some kind of disease, but not studying disease situation directly, right? Which, which people tend to migrate towards immediately. They go, oh, how can this help us right away study IBD or something like that? But you're you're stepping back for yeah, specifically yes, because we know that it will affect yes disease right. um, disease pathogenesis. Um, Very good, Michael. Anything else from you before we wrap it up? No, I think this was a again another very interesting uh, opportunity for our listeners to to really get into the immune system and see the wonder of the microbial world at the same time. Absolutely. Um, one thing I wanted to mention, we have another uh, co-host on TWIM. Her name is Joe Handelsman. She's at Yale. And so she approaches this problem of having so many members of the microbiome and not figuring, not being able to study what they all do. She, she works on caterpillars where there are just a few mm -hmm. bacteria in the gut, and you can manipulate that and see what happens. That's her yeah. approach, which is another approach. But you got, you got the caterpillar approach in mice. You got lucky in that. Yeah, well, bacteria one. is amazing. Yes, they are. So now, you started out as an immunologist. Are you becoming also a microbiologist? I'm trying to, but it's hard. <laughs> it's difficult. <laughs> Michael was right. I'm missing. I'm missing the first seven years there, in microbiology. You'll get there. Yeah, you're you're in the department now, so you'll get it <laughs> yeah. as well. Well, we'll have you back when you do the cell paper, the next cell paper. Okay. We can talk about that. Uh, you can find Twim, of course, at iTunes at Microbe World dot org slash twim and you can also get our app for your iphone or android device over at microworld.org slash app as always send us your questions and comments to twim at twiv.tv evo ivanov is here at columbia university in microbiology and immunology thanks for joining us evo thank you for inviting me did you have fun absolutely it's yeah. a little different great. from the normal daily routine right i know i had i had a great time good thanks again Appreciate it. Tell your friends that we don't bite. <laughs> Microbiologists are nice. Huh? <laughs> Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. It was good meeting you, Evo. Thank you, Michael. Good meeting you, too. Maybe you'll run into each other again one day. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for supporting TWIM, Communications Director Barbara Hyde, and Chris Condayan and Ray Ortega for technical help. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.